All right. So Buddhist philosophy, the way out is in. Again, we're pulling from very key concepts from Buddhism, but we're going to be discussing them through the lens of Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings. Very important because how these concepts are defined varies across traditions. And so I don't want people to think that this is the end-all be-all definition of these concepts and how they're commented on. Uh, remember, this is the lens of a particular tradition and, a, and one teacher. So and this is through the Plum Village Vietnamese Zen tradition. And so over the course of the next five weeks, we'll be discussing the Four Noble Truths and the Two Truths today, followed by the Noble Eightfold Path. Next week, week after, the Three Dharma Seals and the Three Doors of Liberation. Then the Four Measurable Minds and the Three Jewels. And lastly, the Five Aggregates and the Eight Links of Interdependent Core Rising. It's a big mouthful. Um, but these are what we're going to be pulling from. So it's not, again, not, not the entirety of the book, but just a few key elements here that I wanted to touch on throughout this course. And the goal here is to present it in a way that everybody can understand. So the truth of suffering is the first noble truth. And it's followed by the truth of the cause of suffering, the truth of the end of suffering, and the truth of the path leading to the end of suffering. Now, the Four Noble Truths had come from the first Dharma talk from the Buddha, which is on pages six and seven of the book here. So, Sartre Gautama was 29 years old when he left his family to search for a way to end his and others' suffering. And then after a period of time of learning from various different teachers in India and being an ascetic for some time, he had come to the realization of the middle way and offered a teaching to some of his fellow ascetics or sannyasins called the Discourse on Turning the Wheel of the Dharma. And since then, 2,600 years have passed, and the wheel of the Dharma continues to turn. And it's up to us, the present generation, to keep the wheel turning for the happiness of the many. And there's three points to characterize this sutra. The first is the teaching on the middle way. Because the Buddha wanted his five friends to be free from the idea that austerity is the only correct practice. Yeah, I've learned firsthand that if you destroy your health, you have no energy left to realize the path. And we're talking more about the middle way when we get to the sutras. And it comes up again in other classes every now and then. And the second key point from the Four Noble Truths is engagement with the world, that everything interdependence on everything else. This is what we call in this tradition, seeing through the lens of interbeing, that nothing has a permanent inherent self or a soul, but rather everything depends on everything else for existence and survival. We are not an island onto our own. And then the third point here is that, in, okay, engagement with the world. And then the second point, oh yeah. So the second point is the teaching of the Four Noble Truths. And this is the idea of great value during the lifetime of Buddha, great millennia for a time. So Four Noble Truths was part of this as well. And so we're going to dive specifically on the Four Noble Truths because the Interdependency on everything else, we're going to get more into that a little later on today in this presentation, but especially when we get to the 
links of interdependent core rising uh, towards the end of the course. But let's just talk about the four normal truths and keep our focus on here. How do we define suffering? I remember listening to a, a talk from Jordan Peterson who had noted that uh, he was talking to a assembly of college students and said that Buddhism was all about suffering. And if that's the case, then what's the bloody point of living? And he got a quarter of it right. That, yes, we do acknowledge that suffering exists in our lives. However, there's three other points to it. And we'll see why suffering isn't something to be depressed about or to turn people away from Buddhism. But rather, suffering is a gateway towards learning about life and how to touch happiness deeply in whatever the circumstances may be that we come across in our experience. So how we define suffering in this tradition, we use dukkha, which is the Sanskrit word. And the word dukkha comes from the root dus, which is a prefix meaning bad, and ka originally meant hole, as in an axle's hole. Having a poor axle hole would lead to discomfort, hence suffering. Right? So it's this discomfort that we're feeling throughout our lives. It's sort of like grinding away because the axle's hole is not complete. It's, uh, it's constantly kind of rubbing against the edges of our life. And so how do we deal with that? There's three ways of thinking of suffering in our lives, which is the suffering of suffering, the mental and physical suffering that comes from unpleasant feelings. Think like toothache pain, losing one's temper. These things are a little more tangible. Then there's a suffering of composite things, which is the anxiety or stress that is caused when we try to cling to things that are impermanent. All right? So when we lose things in our lives, whether that's people, whether that's objects, then uh, we can suffer because we want to hang on to the things that, that brings us joy and happiness and pleasure. And we tend to push things away that cause us pain. So we cling to those things that give us some sort of happiness or pleasure, or even some of that, that dopamine rush, even something as simple as just your phone. And then there's suffering associated with change like the dissatisfaction, which pervades all of life due to life's transient and changing nature. It's a natural part of life. And as we get older, and I've seen with my parents, my grandparents, is that their behavior tends to change because of the realization of their own mortality, friends and family dying around them. And so there's a bit of a, a suffering there, like what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen to my family, my legacy, et cetera? And there's a certain sadness that pervades. Now, what kind of role does suffering play in our lives? So the Buddha only taught the suffering and the transformation of suffering. So let's talk about the transformation mainly throughout this presentation. What does that mean? And part of it is not spending our lives trying to get rid of suffering, which is just one side of the coin. Because without suffering, you cannot touch the elements of paradise that bring peace and joy in the present moment. Right? So we, if there's this dualistic aspect where we can't have one without the other. It's like if you have this page in this book here, and the cover is suffering, and the inside of it is contentment, peace, and joy, if you took the front away from the other side, is that page still going to exist? No, you can't do that. It's all part of the same page, right? So suffering coexists with peace and joy. And so we can use suffering as a gateway to touch peace and joy in the present moment. If we do so correctly, through some steps we're about to discuss in a moment. We can investigate the cause of suffering to see where on the path we've become lost. So suffering can be a teacher. 
to help us get on the correct path. It's an indicator. Almost like, hey, you took a wrong turn here. And Sangha, fellow practitioners, teachers, are a great way to bring awareness to maybe some of the blind spots that we may not be readily noticeable throughout our lives, things that we're not aware of, and help us course correct. So there's 12 turnings of this wheel. When we talk about the wheel that was in the discourse, discourse, the turning of the wheel, there's 12 turnings. And so there's three different turnings in each of the four aspects of the Four Noble Truths. And so in the first Noble Truth, and we're gonna, it seems kind of simplified, a little mundane on the surface, but in Thich Nhat Hanh's commentary, he goes more in depth here. So in the recognition of suffering, we can already sense that there's something wrong. Not really sure what at this stage yet, what we start to assess, is it physical, is it physiological, psycho psychological? And then once identified, treat our suffering with nonviolence, kindness, non-judgment. In the encouragement, we're taking the time to understand the illness and its causes. We may have to ask our friends or teachers for guidance and support to help us course correct. And there's a wonderful practice in our tradition called Shining of the Light Ceremony. And it's not just for aspirants. It can be for anyone who might request it. But it's required for aspirants in this tradition that at the end of your aspirancy, you have a Shining of the Light Ceremony so that the Sangha can shed light on your blind spots, places you might not realize that you might be struggling with. And they can offer maybe some suggestions on how to smooth out those edges. And then the realization here is successfully naming the suffering in order to better understand it. And it's really important that we are very, very careful with our language here. So, for example, in my experience, I had held on to this story that I was a victim and I blamed my parents for uh, refusing to raise me um, when I was six years old. And um, you know, my father went to prison, my mother was struggling um, mentally, financially after the divorce. And my story was that they abandoned me, right? So when we use language to name our suffering that indicates blame or victimhood, we want to try to steer clear of that. Because then now we're giving our power away to somebody else. And so we want to use something more like, in my case, I uprooted the word abandonment and replaced it with loneliness, sadness, confusion as to why my parents had left me, right? And so when I came to address them later about some of the suffering that I had had throughout the years since my childhood, I was very, very careful about the language that I used because if I had used language that blamed them for what had happened and judged them for it, they would have just become defensive, right? Instead, I tried to approach it non-judgmentally and with a compassionate heart for their circumstances. And the second noble truth, the recognition is, which of the four kinds of nutrients are feeding the suffering? Remember the four nutrients from our fifth mindfulness training, which are what? food, like edible foods, right? Sense impressions, volition, and consciousness. And which of those four is, is feeding our suffering? So I'll just explain some of these. So on volition, the 
story that's told regarding volition in the sutras is that there's two strong men dragging a third man and throwing that man into a pit of glowing embers. Well, what does that mean? So Thich Nhat Hanh pictures this as this is our deep-seated habit energies driving us to accumulate this or that and preventing us from finding happiness in the here and now. That's on page 35. For consciousness, finding a group that is focused on serving others and not consumed by hatred and despair. Because when you join a tribe of people, a group who seem like they're very angry about something, they want to take revenge on something, or they're living in a state of fear, there's these recurring narratives that take place that can get embedded in our thoughts and can take over our lives. And it'll resurface over and over again like a cow regurgitating grass. There's also a story in Buddhism that many of you might be familiar with called the story of the second arrow, where a man is in the woods, he gets struck by an arrow from, could be a, a thief, just hiding in the woods. And this man goes back into town with an arrow in his shoulder. And the doctor in the village says, okay, please calm down. I can, I can help you. Just let me take the arrow out. I'll mend your wound. And the wounded man says, no, I need to grab a weapon and go out into the woods and find this thief or culprit who had shot this arrow into my shoulder. So right away, he's on a quest for revenge, right? And we call that the second arrow, which is instead of addressing the wound and healing it, he's already on a quest to seek revenge for the wrongdoing. He's obsessed with blaming the culprit who had done the act. And so everything is devoted outwards. All that energy, all that time, rather than focusing on healing what's inside. Without recognizing how we feed our suffering by speaking, acting, listening, or thinking in a certain way, we will be stuck in blaming others for our unhappiness. In this case, when we do that, we continue what's called samsara, which is the wheel of suffering, right? It's the cycle of suffering. It's perpetuated because we haven't taken the time to actually heal. Have you ever heard of inter intergenerational trauma? That trauma can get passed down from grandparent to parent to child over and over again because people didn't do the inner work to address it. Whether through psychotherapy or other means. If anything you do in life is to cease generational trauma by working on you and not passing it on to the next generation, I feel like you've already won at the game of life. You've won. You're a success. See if we can embrace our suffering like a mother holding her baby. We are often imprisoned by our perceptions of reality, so ask friends and teachers for their observations and insight. There's no possible way that one person can know everything, even about ourselves. And sometimes it takes someone else looking in to us so they can shine a light on those blind spots. The encouragement here, the energy of mindfulness can help us cease giving in to habitual tendencies and choose what to feed our bodies and our minds. So suffering becomes the door to happiness. You refrain from causing additional harm to yourself or others, and what you want is in harmony with the five mindfulness trainings. We'll talk more about the trainings when we get into the 
noble eightfold path because the five mindfulness trainings are a part of that, particularly right action and right speech. The third noble truth, the recognition is what can bring me joy right now? Maybe it's not necessarily joy. Maybe it's contentment. Maybe it's gratitude. Gratitude is a great gateway to finding joy in the here and now. Even if there's chaos around you, let's say you're in a wartime environment like I was when I was in Iraq, even in the midst of chaos where we're being fired upon, people are screaming, right? Even in those moments, how can I turn it over, turn the page, right? Going from the page of suffering to the page of gratitude, my gratitude would be, okay, I'm still able-bodied. I still have my armor on. I can still run. I still have energy to do something. That's something at least I can be grateful for is that I can help somebody else get out of this situation and out of harm's way. What we don't realize is that, especially as a consumerist culture, is that a lot of the energy they, that we direct outwards towards things, we're looking outwards towards things for happiness, material things especially, thinking that that quick dopamine rush is going to give us what we need to maintain our happiness, when in fact it's like eating sand and not getting any nutrients from it. Or a thief going into a jewelry store and stealing a bunch of jewels and finding out that it's all cheap plastic. Well, you were so happy when you bagged up all those nice looking jewels. What happened? Oh, didn't meet your expectations, I see. But even the jewelry thief might have a jewel in his own pocket and he won't even know it unless he actually looked for it inside of himself, right? It's inside of his own jacket. He didn't even bother to look. In the same way, a lot of times, we don't bother to look inwards into ourselves to find where that happiness is. Sometimes it's in the simpler things in life that often go unnoticed. There's a Zen koan called the cypress tree in the courtyard, where a student goes to his master at the monastery. He had been there a few years. They've been doing chores here and there, cleaning up the kitchen, cooking. His master's sitting at a table eating his soup. And the student slams the tray of plates and bowls on the table and says, Master, when are you going to talk to me about enlightenment and nirvana? And the master looks at him and says, do you see that cypress tree in the courtyard? Sometimes the simpler things in life often go unnoticed. These things can be of benefit and a gateway towards touching happiness and joy in the present. Even just the beauty of a cypress tree. And the encouragement here is to have the courage to face our suffering and not cover it up or run away from it. Just like what that first slide said, the way out is in. So our aim here is to shatter the limited perspective that sees only rage and despair and sadness. The realization that happiness and suffering are not separate from each other. In the same way that we apply the principle of interbeing with the human body, sometimes you might have heard this say that I am a human made of non-human elements, right? There's nothing here that has an inherent self. It's all coming from somewhere else. Conditions came together, and then this body formed and is in existence until it's not anymore. Then all those elements go back to where they came from. In the same way, 
suffering is made of non-suffering elements. Suffering is not a permanent thing. And we'll get more into that a little later because that can be a little cryptic. And the fourth noble truth, recognition that prescription is given, a path out of suffering. In this case, the noble eightfold path that the Buddha had presented to his friends. The encouragement here is to practice the path and learn by reading, listening, discussing, making time for reflection. And when I say making time for reflection, what we're talking about there is stopping, calming, resting, healing. The art of stopping is essential to the Buddhist practice. Another word for it is cultivating stillness. Some people may be a little confused and say that, oh, my meditation is driving in rush hour traffic. My meditation is playing tennis. You could be doing those things mindfully, mindfully playing tennis, mindfully driving your car. If your attention is fully placed on those things without distraction. But I would argue that it's not meditation because you're not cultivating stillness. And the aim of stillness is to is to grow a muscle within the mind so that we don't succumb to the habitual reactions and tendencies to grasp after things without thinking about it appropriately first and taking the time for that. So we're training ourselves to create space between things that happen to us and how we react to them. And instead, you might find yourself responding to the situation in as appropriate action that you can find yourself doing, as opposed to a habitual reaction, something you've always done over and over again. And now you decide to make a change, because not every external situation is the same. In fact, much more complex than we would think. In other words, we're getting off of our wild horse. There's a story of a wild horse on page 24 of your book. And in that story, there's a man riding a wild horse and the horse is speeding away running through the town and there's a man walking along the sidewalk sees this horse racing away and says to the man riding it where are you going sir and the rider says i don't know ask the horse right so this is what i mean by giving in to reactive impulses is that we're actually letting a wild horse take over. We're on autopilot. And in fact, we've given up and surrendered our ability to choose. So the willpower has been lost because we're relying on old, old patterns of behavior, sometimes going back hundreds of years, if not thousands. So the question is, are your choices actually you? Or is it just a mix of preferences and learned behaviors from people and things outside of you? Mm. Maybe take some time to chew on that a little later. So the third noble truth invites us to practice shamatha and vipassana, stopping and looking deeply. Looking deeply into your habits, your choices. How much of it is simply reactionary. And despite our intentions to relieve the suffering in the world, these tendencies or vasanas can overpower us. 
And just being aware of the tendencies alone is a great start. Recognizing them, like, oh, there it is again. Smiling to them as if it's an old friend. And also showing them out the door so we can prevent them from dominating our lives. And so we got a few acronyms here. One of them offered by the book. Another one is RAIN from Tara Brock. I'll just focus on the one from the book for now. So the recognition of the feeling that is arising, right? So we're, we're naming that feeling, just like we talked about earlier. Again, without blame, without insinuating that we're a victim. What's the feeling that's arising? And the acceptance of that feeling that is present, this can be difficult for people who are being triggered by trauma, traumatic experience. You might have to titrate in and out of this just to be comfortable with it, be comfortable with accepting it. You might have to pull back a little bit, take some time, breathe, take in your surroundings, drink your tea, and then lean back into it. See if you can accept it for what it is. But don't run away from it. Because then we're not really learning anything, are we? Embracing that feeling like a mother holding her child, looking deeply into the cause of that discomfort, that dukkha. And now we're cultivating insight. Because we've made space to reflect on it. Understanding that all the complex causes and conditions that can allow us to skillfully act to change the situation. Now, insight can be looked upon almost like when a puddle of water that's cloudy from mud eventually settles. And picture that puddle as if it's your mind. And when you give it space to be still, it might run its course for a bit. Many thoughts running through. Okay, the water's a little cloudy. But as you rest with it, you sit with it, and over time, that cloudiness of the mind begins to settle. It becomes quieter, a little more quieter. And now suddenly, we've developed clarity about how to move forward. And yes, it does take time. But it's better to take an action from a place of clarity than from a place of pain. Resting the body like an animal in the forest allows it to heal naturally. So when you see an animal that's wounded and they go off into a space by themselves, usually out of the way, right? They lick their wounds and take care of themselves. So we can learn from that. Taking the time to take care of ourselves. Instead of leaning into entertainment and distractions. This, again, now the pain, now the fear doesn't get addressed. There's no insight cultivated in that instance because we're running away from it. Sometimes understanding the suffering within us just takes asking the right questions. And the first noble truth I can ask myself, am I ignoring my stress? Am I quick to anger? Absorbed by hopelessness? Any of these could be true. And I may be exhausting my body, making myself sick even. And the stress must be acknowledged to be transformed. So if, let's say, if you are experiencing stress, and I've done this many times before, especially at work. I'll, just, I'll pick up this thing, the phone, right? And you start scrolling. Gotta distract myself from the stress, right? 
But does it really help? No. There's other things that we can do. Try just sitting with yourself. Breathing, drinking your tea. I really like scented oils. Those are fun. You know, taking a big whiff of lavender. Ah, that's nice. And just sitting with that for a little bit. Where is my stress and sadness coming from? And finding the roots of suffering in my misguided ideas and beliefs of how people or things have been or should be. All kinds of expectations and preferences for the world, for the people around us. And it bears so much weight, so much weight on these shoulders. Why not just let that weight fall to the floor? All those preferences are far too much for any one person to carry. Allow them to go. They are merely a house of assumptions built on a mountain of fear. The survival mechanism of the brain to protect itself from potential pain is natural. And it's not something to be discouraged or shunned. However, because the brain is looking for a quick response, a fix-it solution right away, assumptions and conclusions are made about a situation that might not necessarily reflect reality. And this is where we go awry in our decision-making process because we're not responding from a place of clarity, but rather from a place of confusion, delusion even, or perhaps an old story. If I feel stuck in suffering, can I remain diligent in my conviction that it can be transformed through changes in habits or in my way of thinking? And we'll circle back to right diligence next Sunday. But there's a hope, there's a confidence that it can be done because it's been done before and the Buddha paved the way for it as well as many other teachers. And what can I do in this moment to touch happiness that is available to me and others in the here and now? Again, that doesn't necessarily have to be happiness. Contentment, gratitude, peace, whatever is available to you right now Transform suffering, turn the page, and see if you can touch that. There's another acronym I like to use called HALT. It's an oversimplification. It's not always quite as simple, right? But in most situations, and I feel like this is true for most guys, is that our irritability can be boiled down to like four things. So again, that acronym is HALT. You might have heard of it. Am I hungry? Am I irritable because I'm hungry? I need to eat something, right? Am I angry? Because I've been ingesting too much news or social media or perhaps assumptions about a person's intentions. I need to take some time for myself. Go on a walk, maybe. Am I lonely? Could be resorting to video games, even alcohol, drugs, sometimes pornography. And really all we need is just to meet up with a close friend, have a discussion with a person who cares about us. Say, hey, I'm really having a tough time right now. Do you mind going out for just like a cup of coffee? I'll buy, all right? I just need someone to talk to. Guarantee you, there's someone in your life that is willing to do that for you. I know I've got three or four in my life that I, I know they will drop everything at the drop of a hat just to spend that time with me because they care about me. The last one is, am I tired? I get that one a lot. 
And I'm starting to realize the value of naps the older that I get. It's almost a necessity now to, to take a nap during my lunch hour work. Just crawl into my car and just snooze. I'm telling you, it's a game changer. Game changer. So much more productive in the afternoon. Not everybody can do that, but for me, it's, it's gold. So our, our second teaching, and this is the only slide on this, so we're about, about to wrap up here. But the two truths, relative truth, absolute truth. What's the difference? So this is where it gets a little tricky to try to pay attention to this. I'm going to try to explain it the best that I can. The four noble truths say that suffering exists, right? We saw that earlier. And yet, the Heart Sutra says that suffering does not exist. Uh-oh. Paradox. So which is true? Well, it turns out both. Because relative truth is that suffering exists. We see it. it ha it's, yeah, it happens. Yet the absolute truth is that suffering is made of non-suffering elements. Okay, remember I told you I was going to get back to this later. I warned you. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> suffering is not objective, but relies on how we perceive circumstances and our inherited preferences. So the way out of suffering depends on how you look into it. The way out is in. For example, Cutting off my arm, is it suffering? Or could it be a source of joy because I had to cut off my arm to save the rest of my body from a deadly infection? Again, what can we be grateful for here? It all depends on the mind and how we perceive things. You can almost imagine it as looking at a diamond Right, and you're seeing through one facet of that diamond into reality. But it's a little cloudy, it's a little muddied, it's very small, the facet's very tiny, it's almost like looking through a keyhole. You can't quite see everything that's there. Sometimes you have to turn the diamond. It's like, oh, I'm gonna see another perspective here. Right? So we're shifting our perspective ever so slightly. It's very subtle but it has a profound impact. There's a poem from the Buddha on page 123. The first two lines are relative. The second two lines are absolute. Let's see if I can find this here. Let's get to that poem. All conditioned things are impermanent. They are phenomena subject to birth and death, okay? Relative truth. And it goes on to say, when birth and death no longer are, the complete silencing is joy. The complete silencing. What does that mean? The complete silencing is the extinction of concepts. In this tradition, we attribute that to nirvana, the extinguishing of concepts, the conceptual mind. We're going to talk about it later, but signlessness is part of our three doors of liberation. We're liberating the mind through the silencing of concepts. Suffering, concept. Even everything we're talking about in this presentation, concept. Eventually, you have to let it all go. All of it. Unlearn it. And you start getting to the heart of what it means to be human. And not human at the same time. We like to say a human being is not a human being. That is why it is a human being. 
Whether birth and death or even suffering depends on our insight. There are non-human elements that make the concept of a human being possible. Yet this concept is not the whole truth, but merely relative. So if we use the eyes of the Buddha to see the nature of interbeing, then we know we must treasure all that contributes to existence because without it, we wouldn't be here. Even a coral reef off the coast of Australia, if it was gone, would I still exist? So gratitude and contentment arise when the comparative and egoic mind is at rest. Being so caught up in my own successes, in my future, and where I'm going in life, in my trajectory. And yet when that's at rest, I can be grateful for that coral reef off the coast of Australia. Like, oh yeah, thank God that's there. Thank God it's there so I can be here at this moment in time before it's gone. There's a story about two hens about to be slaughtered. And one hen says to the other, the rice tastes much better than the corn today. I think the, the corn is slightly off. What is that hen worrying about? It's worrying about the taste of the, the corn, right? Instead of worrying about the inevitability of being slaughtered. So relative joy? Relative joy is that the rice is better than the corn today, right? But the true joy is the joy of being alive. Being right here, right now. And although the Buddha passed away many, many years ago, relatively speaking, we can still join him for walking meditation every day. because that is absolute reality. Is that what we're learning right now, the teachings of the Buddha, he's present with us in his own teachings. And he carved out a path for us and said, try this, see if it works for you. And that's why we're here.